Hi everyone, welcome to the Endocrine Society panel discussion on the, ch the changing landscape of obesity care. I'm Colleen Williams and I'm the Senior Communications Manager here at the Endocrine Society. We just wanted to go over a couple of quick ground rules before we get started today. Everyone will be muted except for our panelists and we will take questions from reporters following the discussion. So please type any questions that you have into the chat box and include your name and outlet. The webinar is being recorded and it will be available on our YouTube um, following the discussion. Endocrine Society Chief Medical Officer Dr. Robert Lash is our moderator today. We appreciate our obesity experts making time to join today's discussions and I'd like to welcome our speakers. Dr. Ro Pereira of Denver Health Medical Center and the University of Colorado, Dr. Amy Rothberg of the University of Michigan, and Dr. Michael Weintraub of NYU Langone Health and the NYU Grossman School of Medicine. I'll go ahead and turn it over to the Society's Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Robert Lash, to introduce today's discussion. Thank you, Colleen. Um, obesity is a common disease and is taking a significant toll on public health. In the past two decades, obesity prevalence among adults has increased from 30.5% in, in, in 2000 to about 42.5% in the last NHANES survey in 2017, 2018. In, in addition to the obesity prevalence rate in adults, about 20% of children are also obese. And obesity takes a greater toll on some racial and ethnic groups than others. Semaglutide and terzepatide are ch uh, changing the treatment landscape. Both are drugs in the GLP-1 receptor agonist class and were originally used to treat diabetes. However, both drugs also have significant effects on weight loss. The FDA approved a formulation of semaglutide known as Wagovi for weight loss in June of 2021 and granted fast track designation for terzepatide for weight loss in October of 2022. Another weight loss drug, liraglutide, known as Saxenda, received FDA approval in 2020. Research showed these medications are highly effective. Clinical trials have found that formulations of semaglutide reduced patients' weight by up to 15%, and terzepatide helped patients lose 20% of their body weight in a phase three trial. With those uh, with that information in mind, we would like to have a discussion today about the chronic treatment of um, uh, obesity with medications and the obesity treatment landscape in general. And so I'm going to start by asking our panel some questions, and afterwards we'll be opening up our discussion to uh, the, our attendees at large. So I'd like to start with Dr. Pereira. Dr. Pereira, what misconceptions exist in the media and the public around what obesity is? Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Lash, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me to participate in this panel. Um, I am Dr. Ro Pereira. I'm the Director of the Office of Health Equity and the Chief of Endocrinology at Denver Health, which is a model healthcare system in Denver, Colorado. Um, and in answer to your question, there are two major misconceptions about obesity. The first is that it is a cosmetic condition rather than a disease. Obesity, just like diabetes and hypertension, is a disease with serious consequences for health. And so we know that obesity increases a person's risk for metabolic disease. So that includes diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, stroke. Um, it increases the risk for musculoskeletal conditions, arthritis, which can lead to physical disability. And we know that obesity increases the risk for many cancers, including breast cancer. So it has very serious consequences. And then the second major misconception is that individuals have the ability to prevent or cure obesity through diet and exercise. This is just not true. Um, obesity is what we call a multifactorial disease. So meaning there's multiple factors that cause it. Um, these include genetics, the environment, our social networks, our access to healthy foods. And um, although we know that changes in diet and exercise can be can affect body weight, we also know that similar to diabetes and hypertension, most of the time diet and exercise changes are not sufficient to cure or control obesity. 
So it is very important for us to recognize that obesity is a serious disease and one that requires medical management. Thank you very much for that answer. Um, following up on that, I'd like to ask Dr. Rothberg, um, why in the past has obesity not been a treatment priority? Thanks, Dr. Lash, for that question. Interestingly, even though the American Medical Association officially recognized obesity as a disease nearly a decade ago, again, like Dr. Pereira said, many people view obesity as a lifestyle choice or perhaps even a personal flaw rather than a health condition that really requires effective evidence-based interventions. And I think we should view obesity as we do other diseases, just like she said, such as high blood pressure. I would go as far as talking about uh, an analogy to HIV and AIDS. Um, I think that obviously we reviewed HIV AIDS in the 80s at, um, in terms of sort of blaming the victim and people died as a consequence of that. Uh, even cancer for, may, uh, for many may be considered a chronic disease, but we look upon someone living with cancer as having a lot of courage. We don't afford that same dignity to people living with obesity. And so I think it really puts in peril um, those people living with obesity. It unnecessarily stigmatizes them. And so they are not accessing health care as they should. Thanks, Dr. Rothberg. Um, so in the past, we have not really looked at obesity as a priority to treat, but over the past few months, it has been everywhere as a priority to treat. And this has been because of some of the newer medications that have recently been approved. So I'd like to ask Dr. Weintraub, how effective are anti-obesity medications for long-term weight loss and maintenance? And could you talk a little bit comparing the newer drugs we have available now with the drugs that we had before and why things may have changed because of what the new drugs potentially offer. Certainly, and, and thank you again for having me. Um, and I think a good place to start before talking about how effective anti-obesity medications are is looking at and discussing what's the effectiveness of lifestyle changes. Um, of individuals who undergo intensive changes, even with behavioral therapy um, through you know, changing their diet, their activity, only one third can really achieve a weight loss of more than 5%. So it's incredibly difficult to achieve and maintain uh, weight loss with lifestyle changes alone. And why is that? Uh, we're shaped by evolution to defend a certain fat mass or body weight set point. So when we lose weight, our body doesn't know we lost that weight intentionally. And our body physiology actually pushes back to regain that weight through various mechanisms, such as increasing appetite and decreasing energy expenditure. So all the studies of intensive lifestyle changes follow this familiar pattern. We have this period of weight loss and then this slow but inevitable regain of that weight. Um, however, when we pair these uh, lifestyle changes with uh, anti-obesity medications, we can maintain weight loss by suppressing our own um, body's compensatory mechanisms. Um, so medications we utilize uh, usually act centrally, so on those appetite centers of the brain um, to decrease food cravings and intake so that weight loss is sustainable. Um, there are a growing number of FDA approved anti-obesity medications that demonstrate weight loss and uh, that can be maintained long-term. Um, so in response to your question, Dr. Lash, regarding kind of the, 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 these newer generation of medications compared to what we had previously, um, so we conducted a retrospective review um, of 428 patients who presented to our Academic Weight Management Center um, and this is before the GLP-1s and GLP-1 GIP uh, agonists were widely available. Um, and these patients were offered anti-obesity medications and were followed for a period of three to five years. And these patients lost and maintained 10.4% of their body weight. Um, so in this cohort, that amounted to 23 pounds. Um, and this weight loss was maintained through the end of that study period, a median of 4.7 years. Um, so we demonstrate in this study that anti-obesity medications are effective and not only in that clinical trial setting, but also in the real world setting over a long period of time, um, up to five years. 
Um, and weight loss with that magnitude, 10% or more, we know can reverse these metabolic abnormalities that we might see with type 2 diabetes, with cardiovascular disease, and other diseases where obesity is that root cause. Um, and uh, as Dr. Lash pointed out, now we have semaglutide. Um, so that showed in its step three trial that it was effective for weight reduction, specifically in these patients with obesity, with the 15% weight loss on average when combined with lifestyle changes. And then now the newest drug, terzepatide, in the Surmount 1 trial, again, of patients specifically with obesity, uh, demonstrate a weight loss of 22% on that highest dose of terzepatide. So now uh, we have even more effective tools to help patients lose and maintain uh, a greater degree of rate, uh, weight loss, uh, and we can thus reverse or prevent those complications of obesity. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, going back to Dr. Pereira, um, so with that in mind, with Dr. Weintraub was just discussing, um, why do you think anti-obesity medications have been what many, many people say underutilized in the past? We think yeah. that there are 42% of patients have obesity um, and a lot of people are also overweight yet the, num the percentage of people who are on any kind of anti-obesity medication or even in a behavioral program is actually quite small. And could you comment a little bit about why you think that might be? Yeah, absolutely. So we know that on the patient side, there continues to be a lot of stigma associated with weight. And even our patients will say, you know, they are not doing enough to control their diet and exercise. So um, uh, patients, I think, don't have an understanding that uh, that obesity is uh, something that needs medical treatment um, and, and that there's medical treatment that's available. Um, uh, people often are not aware that there is effective treatment. And again, um, just recently, we have more effective treatment. So um, we just need to increase awareness of those, uh, those medications. Um, patients also sometimes are concerned that they're going to regain the weight when they stop a medication. And um, though this is a legitimate concern, um, just like with hypertension and diabetes, we know that you need to continue taking a medicine for it to have an effect. And there's great benefit to the weight loss seen with the medicines. Um, so when you look at the cost benefit analysis, it really makes sense for people to, to use medications when it's needed. Um, an another barrier, of course, is cost. Many of these medications are still not covered by insurance, and so they're not affordable for our patients. And then on the provider side, we still do not do enough to discuss obesity with our, with our patients um, and offer obesity medications. Sometimes uh, we ourselves are focusing too much on behavioral changes and um, or we're assuming our patients will not be able to afford these medications. Um, and again, until recently, we haven't had highly effective medications to offer our patients. And so I think all of this is going to be changing. Very interesting. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Weintraub, Dr. Rothberg, do you have any thoughts about why medication, other thoughts about why medication or treatment in general might be underutilized in this group of people? Well, again, as we have alluded to earlier, and I've spoken to regarding the disease itself, I think there's just stigma attached to taking a medication for obesity whereas we don't have that stigma associated with other uh, health conditions. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Rothberg, don't, don't mute yourself quite yet. The next question's for you. Sure. Um, uh, we've been talking about medications and behavioral therapy, but uh, bariatric surgery is also a major component of uh, anti-obesity treatment. Would you like to talk a little bit about how bariatric surgery fits into the treatment landscape? And is it being underutilized at this point? Absolutely. It is an incredibly effective modality and uh, really has... Uh, the improvements in bariatric surgery, um, the surgery itself has carries now very, very little risk. It, the, the risk of that operation is analogous to go undergoing an elective cholecystectomy for gallstones. Uh, but it, it, and it, unfortunately, the uptake is very poor. And I think the uptake is poor largely because of limited or no payer coverage. And uh, it is, um, 
I think often utilized a little bit uh, late in the game where people could have uh, resolved many of their health conditions associated with underlying obesity had it been used earlier in the course of their other diseases. Nevertheless, even when uh, later, it is uh, still incredibly effective, particularly effective uh, for uh, another epidemic, type 2 diabetes. And Thanks for that. I, uh, yes, Dr. Pereira. Yeah, I, I would just add that also bariatric surgery uh, access has been increasing, increasing for our youth. Um, and when you think about the possible benefits to treating obesity in uh, somebody who's younger, who has their whole life ahead of them, and um, the, the consequence of uh, having to battle diabetes and possible consequences, di um, diabetes and hypertension, um, as opposed to having a, a surgery, you know, this is really um, important to consider extending those services to our youth. And, and to piggyback off of Dr. Pereira and uh, Rothberg, um, the, with the growing um, uh, safety of these uh, procedures, um, actually, one of the major um, guidelines uh, published by the American Society for Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery uh, just came out with a modification um, several months ago where they lowered the BMI cutoff of those who they would recommend surgery for. Um, so that body mass index of anyone greater than 35 um, now is, is, the, is a recommendation that they would be eligible for bariatric surgery, along with uh, those with a BMI greater than 30 who might have comorbidities uh, such as type 2 diabetes. Um, however, you know, just like we mentioned before, um, there's still a lack of, of uh, payment by insurance, even with this, these lower cutoffs. So hopefully that will change and, and be corrected in the future. Um, staying with that theme of barriers to treatment, Dr. Weintraub, could you talk a little bit about what some of the barriers are to obtaining medications to help treat obesity? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. So as Dr. Pereira just mentioned, um, I think the most notable barrier is the cost uh, to patients for these, uh, these uh, newer medications. Uh, many insurance companies are choosing not to cover uh, medications for the treatment of obesity. Um, and these new medications are expensive. Um, uh, without insurance coverage, many patients are unable to afford them. And those patients who are unable to afford them are also the ones that are most vulnerable uh, to the consequences of obesity. Um, so continued lack of insurance coverage only will widen those health disparities that we have in our, our country. So hopefully this uh, will be corrected in the future. In your experience or the experience of anybody on the panel, have uh, drug shortages played a role in people being unable to um, obtain medications for treatment? Most certainly. This is one of the major problems that we are seeing, particularly since October of last year, although this has gotten better more recently, but there was, were national shortages largely caused by, I think, um, uh, direct-to-consumer messaging um, and, uh, uh, and being prescribed for um, maybe largely inappropriate reasons, but also manufacturer issues. I, I think we're reaching the end of that, though, um, sort of like the end of inflation, I hope. So <laughs> no comment. Um, but so I, I am pretty sanguine that uh, these are going to be available um, or uh, that people are going to have uh, access uh, to them now. And I would add in terms of the shortages that we're seeing that uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear that those shortages are hopefully ending, um, but just thinking about who those shortages affect the most, it really is those, those populations that are, um, that have the lowest resources and, um, you know, uh, the people who have the resources and have the money are, uh, are the ones that are more likely to be able to get the medications when they're, especially when there's those shortages. Thanks for that. Um, and um, moving on to um, when the medications are more readily available, um, who would be, who's a good candidate for anti-obesity medications? Dr. Rothberg, I'll let you go first on that one. Well, I think anybody who continues to struggle um, to maintain or achieve a reduced weight despite 
you know, vigorous and rigorous attempts at lifestyle intervention. And even those who have undergone bariatric surgery, uh, but are uh, seeing an uptake in their uh, weight. Again, uh, these are all due to uh, our underlying biology. I think, in fact, that um, we, again, like bariatric surgery, should probably I would argue in favor of even um, uh, ratcheting down the indications for uh, obesity medications starting earlier at perhaps lower BMIs, just as they've done with bariatric surgery, and really for those who are at great risk, who have underlying risk factors. Um, but right now we have certain clinical indications for whom they are appropriate. That is those with a BMI of 27 with weight-related comorbidities or a BMI of 30 and above. Now, one of those weight-related comorbidities would be diabetes. Um, and so I wanted to ask Dr. Pereira, if, if, if people who with diabetes are having trouble accessing these medications either for their diabetes or for their diabetes and weight status, if, 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 if that's appropriate. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, though we know that those newer medications improve blood glucose, they improve um, heart function, um, and they help with weight loss, they are still a lot of times not covered by insurance plans or people have very high co-pays and so they're not able to afford them despite all the indications for using them. Um, we also just talked about the shortages, of course, of medications, <clears throat> and, and these affect people with uh, diabetes as well as everybody else who doesn't have diabetes. So these two issues have been a problem for our patients with diabetes. So one, Dr. Perry, just to follow up on that, one problem you know, that endocrinologists have talked about for years is that when patients with diabetes need to go on insulin, that the idea of giving themselves an injection is a, a bit of a um, roadblock to overcome. These weight loss medications are also injectable. Do you find that you have the same kind of resistance to starting an injectable medication? Yeah, interestingly, people are much more willing to inject the medication that's going to help them lose weight and improve their blood sugar than insulin. Um, and insulin, I think people think about insulin and think um, daily injections or multiple daily injections. They think uh, insulin is associated with weight gain, which is true. Um, and so there's, there's those associations with insulin, negative associations with insulin that keep people from wanting to get on insulin, um, even with the, when they need insulin for blood glucose control. Whereas these medications, um, many are available for weekly as weekly injections. And that is much, much easier for people to agree to. Um, and uh, obviously the added benefit of improving weight helps people get excited and uh, be willing to at least try the medications. So there's no such thing as a free lunch. Um, as, uh, these, do these medic, Dr. Ra Dr. Weintraub, these medications have side effects, uh, problems that we should be thinking about, um, or is it or really just a panacea for all things weight related? Yeah, so um, the, every medication has side effects, including these. Um, so these GLP-1 agonists or the GLP-1 GIP dual agonists um, do have side effects. Um, uh, so the gastrointestinal uh, adverse events are the most common. So those include uh, nausea, diarrhea, constipation. Um, and if we look at you know, a recent meta-analysis um, that pooled all the trials of terzepatide together in 6,000 patients, um, they found that ga gastrointestinal events did occur in 40 to 50 percent of patients, uh, depending on the dose. Um, however, drug discontinuation ultimately um, uh, uh, only occurred in less than 10 percent of patients. So most of these patients do um, end up uh, tolerating and uh, basically use GI side effects do um, uh, are mitigated over time. There are more serious adverse events, um, uh, although, albeit thankfully, very rare. Um, so those include cholelithiasis or gallstones, uh, pancreatitis, um, uh, hypoglycemia. Uh, again, going back to this meta-analysis, uh, well under 1% of patients um, uh, uh, had these uh, adverse events. Um, so just like any medications, uh, you know, they do have risks, but most are mild. Uh, and the risks always have to be weighed against the benefits. 
um, of, of weight loss and, and the treatment of type 2 diabetes. And may I just add yeah, that please, add, please Dr. Rothbard. Um, because of those GI side effects, there is a very slow dose escalation. And so people uh, are accommodated very easily to um, those side effects or they vanquish with slow dose escalation. The other um, issue is that the best responders are actually the ones who have um, notably the GI side effects up front. Um, and we've noticed this with other diabetes medications as well when that tend to have nausea as a side effect that people do tend to lose a few pounds um, from that nausea. Um, let's take a big, let's take a step backwards and look at the obesity epidemic um, from a public health perspective. Dr. Pereira, if we don't address the obesity epidemic, what are the implications for public health across the nation? Yeah. Obesity, the consequences of obesity we know are incredibly costly to our patients, our healthcare systems, our society. We've talked about diabetes. Um, people with diabetes spend twice as much money on healthcare than those without diabetes. We know that uh, obviously hypertension, heart disease are very, very costly to individuals as well as to the healthcare system. And then just thinking about the lost productivity. So if you have osteoarthritis, um, you are not able to work. Um, if you have diabetes and it's not well controlled and you have the complications of diabetes, you're also not able to work. And so um, and our rates of, di of obesity continue to increase. And so this is becoming a, just a more and more uh, serious epidemic that we just, we need to address. Um, Dr. Rothberg, you've been doing some interesting work in this area in the, around uh, the question of military readiness and obesity. Would you say a few words about that? Sure, unfortunately, obesity, as you know, affects every uh, sector of our society and has implications for our national security. Uh, many individuals, in fact, 40% of our military personnel are now affected by obesity. And we are not able to meet our quota uh, for recruits because they are unfortunately just unfit to serve in our military. So we do need these therapies that we've been talking about today to ameliorate that underlying situation uh, <clears throat> and to, to mitigate both the personal and societal costs. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Dr. Rothberg. Um, Dr. Weintraub, a two-part question. Um, should we be encouraging the broader use of anti-obesity medications? Uh, yes. Um, as, as we kind of uh, discussed, it's greatly underutilized, and um, there are a number of benefits of preventing uh, these downstream complications that can occur. Um, so, you know, how do we do that? Well, greater education among providers uh, that obesity is a chronic disease, just like we've mentioned. Um, and just like any other disease, it requires a chronic medical treatment. Um, and then on the side of the public, uh, having increased awareness of the different treatment options that we have, you know, not only the lifestyle modifications, but also what medications we have, what surgery options there are. And so patients can, can understand what are the treatment options and which one is right for them. Um, and then lastly, you know, what would encourage kind of a broader use of these medications um, is the development of you know, further down the pipeline and development even, uh, even more novel medications that uh, have less side effects are even more effective. And we have those in the pipeline. Um, uh, and that's, I think the most exciting aspect of this field is that you know, semaglutide and terzepatide may only be the beginning. Um, and there are a number of drugs that, uh, that mimic slightly different combinations of hormones uh, that can unlock even a greater degree of weight loss with less side effects. All right, a question for the three of you. Um, there are only about 7,500 endocrinologists in the United States, and only a small number of those are specialists in weight loss. They're you know, 40, over 40% 40 of our country, and that's, hundreds, that's over 100 million people, easy, um, have obesity. 
who should someone who uh, has obesity, who wants to get treated, who should they be talking to and who should be the right person to treat their disease? So I, I will start. Thanks, uh, my, <laughs> my opinion is that all providers should be trained to provide obesity management. Um, oh, and, and, and I think that is the direction we are moving in. Um, primary care providers, at least in our organization, are much more comfortable using these medications and treating patients. Um, and I, I think that's going to be the trend. We can't rely on the few of us who are endocrinologists to do all the management of, of this disease. Dr. Weintraub? I, I totally agree. I think the, the, first, uh, the first person that uh, patients go to is their primary care provider when they have any questions um, or symptoms of anything. Um, and that should be also the first uh, person to offer treatment for obesity. Um, and I think, at, at least in my area, we're starting to see that, um, that primary care providers are, are uh, already initiating um, semaglutide or terzepatide. Um, and that's, you know, that's very uh, promising. Uh, and so greater education to primary care providers that, you know, this is a chronic disease and requires chronic treatment um, and, and kind of dissemination to all the patients. I think that that is, you know, something that we're already seeing, which is great. And Dr. Rothberg, you get a you get a modified version of this question. Um, if a primary care provider is a great place to start, which patients are best to see in a, a specialist such as an endocrinologist for help with obesity treatment? So I think those who have more challenging uh, comorbidities, particularly those perhaps uh, like type 2 diabetes on insulin, where medical monitoring and adjustments of insulin and other medications need to be done. But I think for the most part, uh, our primary care physicians are very adept at managing individuals with obesity. I, let me just say, though, I think um, medical education is woefully uh, insufficient in terms of offering both um, uh, education in nutrition and metabolism, but also in obesity, but that landscape is also changing. So uh, again, the primary care physicians are the first, they are our gatekeepers and they are the ones first tasked with taking care of individuals with obesity. And they're often seeing them for the other comorbidities. And I think they are so happy, elated in fact, that they now have the option of using pharmacological therapy uh, to treat obesity to help them either remit or certainly improve their underlying um, other health conditions. Well, thanks for that. I want to thank all three of our panelists for sharing these uh, insights today. Um, I'm going to open the floor up now to questions from our um, journalist guests. And please type your questions into the chat window. And don't forget to include your name and your affiliation. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to one of my colleagues, um, Colleen, who's going to help um, with these questions. Thank you, Rob. Go ahead and open up the chat window here. Um, okay, our first question is from Mike Minostra um, at Endocrine Today. When it comes to shortages for anti-obesity medications, did any of you on the panel experience these shortages firsthand? And can you speak in more detail about why these shortages happened? Was it because of supply chain issues, direct to consumer messaging, or something else? I know that was a long question, so if you need me to repeat, just let me know. So I, I can I address that. Oh, sorry, Bro. No, no, go ahead, Amy. Um, well, uh, so I... Yes, the shortages affected me and my practice of medicine, and I'm going to speak on behalf of my colleagues here, probably affected theirs, and it was all of the above. It was a manufacturing issue on the part of Novo Nordisk, who makes some agglutide. Uh, you know, there was direct-to-consumer advertising, so the uptake uh, was uh, much greater uh, than they anticipated, and then, of course, there were shortages created by people sort of using them um, maybe off-label for other uh, unintended or intended purposes, but not a, a pro necessarily appropriate purposes. Dr. Rothberg, did anyone else want to weigh in? 
I, I was just going to add uh, my experience with our patients was that um, sometimes I was increasing the medication dose and that new dose, that new higher dose was not available. And then patients didn't have more supply of the current dose. And so we had this very, a lot of interactions trying to get the patient back on the, the previous dose. Um, uh, so there were, there were a lot of issues and there continue to be actually here for us, a lot of issues in accessing these medications due to shortages. Thank you. We have another question from Jamel with the Associated Press. How do you address the huge skepticism on the part of the public that medications and surgery are necessary to treat obesity? The evidence may show it, but people don't believe it. I think this gets back to this stigma related to obesity and not considering it as what it is, a disease rather than a lifestyle choice. I think as the public becomes or has greater awareness that it really is a disease, uh, we'll hear less and less uh, skepticism about uh, these effective treatments. And I would add, we, we need to somehow um, separate the, the image piece to the, and the disease piece or the metabolic consequences or the disease consequences of obesity. And so um, the fact that you need medication to control obesity does not mean that it, any weight is um, in particular uh, a, a bad thing in terms of appearance or that you have to have an ideal body weight in order to be healthy. But we know that obesity is associated with these diseases. And so thinking about what, what is it doing to our um, body and where are the risks for disease um, with the, the current weight of that individual is really important. Great, thank you, Dr. Pereira. Uh, the next question we have here is from Kristen at Clinical Advisor. Do we have enough research on use of newer obesity medications in the pediatric population to support the AAP's recent recommendations on obesity treatment? I'll defer to my colleagues because I'm an adult endocrinologist, so I, I don't work in that space. And I think that's the reason why we're all uh, more silent since we're adult endocrinologists. But I, you know, I, I would you know go back to the the step teens trial, um, which was published. Uh, it was conducted in in adolescents with obesity and and um, and looking at semaglutide and the effectiveness of semaglutide at at weight loss. Um, and we did see uh, you know weight loss in that. In that trial, and I think that's probably that's one of the uh, the trials that supported this recommendation. Thank you, Dr. Weintraub. Uh, this next question is from Elaine Chen at Stat News, and this is for Dr. Rothberg. Um, why do you think we should lower the BMI threshold for these new obesity meds? There already is debate on how good of a measurement B BMI is and arguments that people with BMI in the 30s range may be metabolically healthy. Yes, I would contend also the uh, converse is also true, that there are people, particularly certain racial and ethnic uh, groups, that have much lower BMIs but still have what we consider um, increased adiposity for every level of BMI. And we are neglecting that population because they manifest the comorbidities just as one would uh, who ha may have a higher BMI. Um, so I, I think, well, there is some argument about BMI. It's a great screening measure, but it is not the only measure. And so many of us who uh, do live in this space also measure other things. We look at the whole person, we look at their other risk factors, 
We um, often measure waist circumference, which is an excellent surrogate uh, for central adiposity and metabolic uh, derangement. So while, yes, you could argue that um, BMI is imperfect, uh, we have to start uh, somewhere. And we can, uh, and yes, while there may be people living with a BMI of greater than 30 that are metabolically healthy, there are also people living with a BMI of 27 who are metabolically unhealthy. And we need to um, treat those individuals. And I would add this, this is not dissimilar to A1C and diabetes. A1C is not a perfect measure of diabetes glucose control. Um, and so I think we need to use BMI as one data point, but also as Dr. Rothberg said, consider other metrics and other measurements. Thank you. Um, this question is from Karen Weintraub at USA Today. Can you please talk about long-term safety and effectiveness data for the newer medications? Do we have five-year data that shows improved health and maintenance of weight loss? And what about for use-dependent developing bodies? Um, I can take that uh, question. Yes, no relation. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so we've had this class of medications, the GLP-1 agonists. Um, the, the first was uh, approved in 2005, or exanatide. Um, so we're going on 20 years worth of, uh, almost 20 years worth of data. Um, and the side effect profiles and adverse event uh, data are, are becoming rel clear that, uh, especially relative to other medications that we uh, had for uh, the indication of weight loss, um, the safety data is uh, rather remarkable. Um, you know, we talked about the, uh, the adverse events of gastrointestinal side effects being the most common. Um, and then the more severe adverse effects um, are, you know, less than 1%. Um, so those be being pancreatitis, uh, biliary disease like gallstones, um, and, and those types of adverse events. So, you know, when looking at kind of the risks and benefits of somebody who has obesity, along with maybe other comorbidities, uh, uh, the, the benefits of this medication certainly outweigh the risks. Uh, we have a couple questions here from Media Scoop. Do we have any idea of the um, attributable part of metabolic control provided by semaglutide and or terzepatide that is not related with the direct action on glycemic? This question is related to the use of these new medications and patients with type 2 diabetes. Uh, so I think I understand this question. Um, both these drugs work in a glucose dependent fashion to lower glucose, so they have direct effects on glycemic control, but they also serve. Uh, to reduce weight, and weight itself uh, has impact uh, on glycemic control. So there's sort of a two-pronged uh, approach um, or uh, favorable outcomes related to uh, these drugs. Yeah, and and um, oh, when we think of obesity or excess weight, uh, really that, that boils down to excess, adipos excess adiposity or, or fat cells. And that's what drives an increased inflammatory environment. And that inflammatory environment is what drives um, higher cholesterol levels, uh, increased glucose levels, um, and then increased risk factors for cardiovascular disease and stroke. So if we can reduce that excess adiposity, then we can reduce the, the development of those risk factors uh, in, an, in a totally independent way of glycemic control. Great, thank you both. I believe that's all the questions in the chat. Um, if you have any additional questions, just follow up with us and we can get those answered for you. I wanted to thank our speakers and all the reporters for joining us today for this awesome discussion. Uh, the recording will be up on our YouTube channel in the coming days. And again, to set up an interview or for any other questions, please feel free to contact us at media at endocrine.org. Thanks everyone for joining and have a great rest of your day. Thank you for joining us today.